Hey guys, I uh, don't really even know how to begin a video like this. I don't know how to make a video like this. I don't even know where to begin, but I'll do my best because it's important for me to make videos and share my life and at least even document it because it's something that I've always done. And I think that for many of you all who are in, have been, or will be in this situation, it could also help you guys too. Last week my mom passed away and I'll be honest, I still can't come to terms with it. I still feel like every time I say it, I'm lying. Like, oh, well, she'll be back next week. Gosh, you know, she's just on a trip. She'll be back. I'll go into her room uh, before I go to bed, and I'll look for her to say goodnight to her, and wake up and look in her chair where she would sit in and see if she's there. And there's a big part of me that hopes that never stops. And I, uh, this is probably the worst thing and the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with so far and I I don't know if I'll ever really be the same and um, I, I kind of wanted to share what happened and uh, talk a little bit more about her and just kind of uh, just, just talk about it I guess uh, so for a little bit of context I live in Austin Texas and I've lived here pretty much my whole life I moved here when I was like six months old and um, the rest of my family and pretty much everybody else in my family is in Florida, uh, Georgia, and New York, and a few other states too. And uh, that's pretty much about it. So here in Texas, I've got my mom and my dad. And whenever I was growing up, they were the two most important people in my life. And I, my parents are divorced and I lived with my mom. So I spent so much time with her and with only her. And I also want to make one thing just absolutely crystal clear is that um, while this is a huge thing for me because of how much time I spent with my mom, uh, my dad has been the best father that anybody could ever ask for. Uh, he's been there for me, he's taught me so many things, and he's, he's been, even the things that, that pissed me off whenever I was a kid that he would do, now whenever I'm getting older I think to myself, well I'm gonna do that probably to my kids too, you know, it was for the best. Fuck. Uh, so I don't want to make this in any way, shape, or form that, um, you know, it's not about him too, but uh, my mom, I lived with her, and uh, for the past 10 years, I've taken care of her. I've been, in a way, a, a caretaker for her. Uh, she was 70 years old. She was overweight. She smoked, and she basically lived her life like a college freshman. She sat around uh, getting high and uh, smoking cigarettes and uh, eating fast food, drinking soda, and watching reruns of Ancient Aliens. And to be fair, that's what she wanted to do. And she did exactly what she wanted. And that is a good and also a bad thing. Uh, I tried for many years to try to get her to stop smoking and to try to get her to uh, take her diet and her health more seriously. And uh, she would occasionally make a half-hearted measure to do that, but for the most part, she wouldn't. I, I learned about cigarettes, about how bad they were when I was like eight or nine years old. And I come home and I'm like, did you know that this, it can do this, that, and the other thing? And I was like, what is going on? Why are you doing this? Why are you smoking these? And she just, it, it could never really be understood to me why she continued smoking. And I was just so upset and I tried and I'll always wonder um, if it was like my fault in a way because I would uh, I would buy cigarettes for her is it is it my fault in a way that she is where she is and what happened happened because I bought the cigarettes for her uh, the logical part in my brain tells me that no it's not because somebody else would have just bought them for her anyway but there's still another part of my brain that does feel guilt and I don't know if that was the right decision or not. Can you really protect a person from himself? It's impossible. And I, I did try. I didn't. I, I failed though. And uh, uh, anyway, so smoking for 50 years uh, gives you something called COPD. And uh, my mom got COPD quite a while ago. And over the years, it's just gotten worse. That's the way the disease works. And uh, basically, 
about like 10 years ago or so, she first went to the hospital for the first time. And she came out with, in a lot of ways, a clean bill of health. And I tried to get her to, you know, like live differently, exercise more, etc. And it didn't really happen. I, I tried to, the garden that I've showed you all many times, I planted that garden in the hopes that she would go out and, um, uh, and, and like maybe take care of the plants or something, you know, and that didn't really happen. She just did what she wanted to do. And, and uh, so the, the disease got worse, right? And uh, this is kind of the first time she went to the hospital and the second time. And uh, then there was a long period of time where she didn't. And then she started walking around the house with a cane. And I, I, I was like, why are you doing this? Why are you using a cane? Just walk around normally. And it was, it was this childish and stupid thing for me to think because I, I knew why. I just didn't want to admit it to myself. And um, anyway, so this is maybe a few months ago. I don't want to make this video super long. Is that a few months ago, she, uh, she just kind of had really, really bad breathing problems. Like it went kind of from like, it was like zero to 60. Or it was actually like, if you want to talk about her oxygen, it was more like 95 to 60. And uh, 75, something like that. Her oxygen went down very drastically, quite fast. And um, I call. I remember I was like right here out in this deck, and I called a nurse's hotline, and they said that I needed to call an ambulance for her right away. And I didn't do that because she was just like begging me not to do that. Don't don't call an ambulance. Don't call an ambulance. Don't do that. And the reason is that uh, her and I we grew up uh, quite poor and. Um, like not dirt poor and my dad has always had my back with things for sure but we did grow up poor and uh, in the process of that seeking medical care in the United States is not necessarily the uh, most reasonable prospect and so anyway uh, I, I was able to convince her to go down to the hospital that night and she was there for uh, three or four days and there was a good bit of relief for me because I was able to just kind of relax a little bit and know that she was in good hands. But I got a call uh, maybe four or five days afterwards from her and she was just so adamantly against being in the hospital. She did not want to be in the hospital that she said that if I didn't come down there and get her that she was just going to get a taxi and drive home herself. And My mom's always had this uh, it's been like a streak of just kind of, I'll do whatever I want to do. It doesn't matter what the cost is. And it was like in a way unrealistic, like how could you possibly do that? But this is just what she would say. And I was so worried that she would hurt herself in the process of trying to do that, that I went and I took her home uh, against medical advice. Uh, and I, I, again, another thing that I don't know if it was the right decision or not, I was afraid that she would sabotage herself in some other way and it just really scared me to even think about that because I didn't know what was going to happen. I, could, I, I, I can't know what a person is going to do and so I just kind of had to make the best decision I could and I don't know if it was the right one or not. So she went home with an oxygen machine and um, she didn't use it for quite a while and then finally whenever she started to use it. Um, things kind of got uh, things got better and um, then they were just kind of on a slow decline uh, they just kind of got worse and worse and worse as the days went by and this was over maybe a two-week period and uh, she didn't even use the oxygen machine I had to call the EMS because we had a, uh, a doctor's appointment for her and she uh, she just couldn't get out of her chair and finally I convinced her to let me call EMS and uh, I'll tell you something, man, like I've never encountered people that were more professional and more uh, intelligent and competent than the people that came uh, in the ambulance and the fire truck to help her uh, both times. Uh, I, I, I consider myself so very lucky that we had those people and we were able to uh, uh, have it taken care of in such an effective way. Excuse me. And, and obviously throughout the, like the 10 years, 
I, I missed many opportunities and many things that I couldn't really do whenever I was in my 20s because I had to take care of her and, and do things for her and be there for her. And she would always be very, uh, she would always say that, oh, it's fine, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. But I knew it wasn't true. And I, I, I had to do those things. And I want to make one thing very clear is that I did every single thing like that with no regret, no resentment, nothing. I would do that again. I'd be doing that right now if she was still in that house. And uh, whenever uh, my dad gets older, I'll be doing that for him. And uh, if, you know, I have a wife and she has problems, I'll be doing that for her. Uh, it's, that's, that's, that's who I am. And I'll always do everything that I can to help and protect people that I care and I love. And um, anyway, it, it was at a cost, though. Um, and so uh, throughout those years, kind of the scope of things that I would do and things that she would do uh, waned. They waned uh, much more over to my side, where I was doing uh, all the laundry, I was doing all the dishes and everything. And, uh, towards the very end, I was just doing everything. I would wake up in the morning, and I would uh, uh, I would cook dinner for her, or, sorry, cook breakfast for her, and then go back to sleep, and then wake up and make sure that she's okay. And um, I could only sleep for maybe two hours a night whenever this was happening. And uh, the first time that she ever really had like a big health scare, this was in like 2012, 2013. And ironically, it's the reason her having this health scare was the reason why I uh, uh, why I started making YouTube videos because I had to quit going to school because I couldn't bear to not be there and and help her and take care of her. And back then, we didn't have the money to hire a caretaker or a nurse or anything. Uh, we didn't even have the money to have hot water. So um, anyway, uh, that's whenever I started doing YouTube. And uh, I remember waking up and like hearing her screaming my name. And for the next like six months or a year, maybe two years, it's hard for me to really remember back then. Uh, I would not be able to sleep for more than like uh, an hour and a half, two hours without hearing those screams in my head and it waking me up and having to go out and check to see if she's still alive. And this, uh, this started happening again recently. And, uh, I couldn't really get any sleep. I couldn't rest at all. Uh, anytime I would wake up, it would just be immediately a panic attack. And it was just awful. And uh, anyway, so uh, fast forward to, I guess, maybe two weeks, three weeks, no, not two weeks ago, like three or four weeks ago. Um, I was out here in this exact uh, chair, uh, sitting in this tree house. And I was, um, I was, doing a, a news video about just different stuff that I'd want to go online to talk about. And in the process of that, my mom texted me and she asked me to bring her a Pepsi. And um, I went in to check on her and she was not doing well. And she was wanting to go to the hospital, uh, you know, within probably the next 24 to 48 hours. And I was uh, glad to hear that, especially with how she had left last time, because that's where I thought she had been to begin with. And um, I, uh, I I go and I come back and I'm sitting right here in this chair looking at this this uh, this phone right here and talking. And I just decide I'm like I'm just too stressed out. I have to I have to leave and I have to go. And so I, I leave and I go to lay down and uh, I'm laying down stressed out, like really worried. And like my room's right next to her room. And just out of nowhere, I hear a crash, uh, I hear glass breaking, I hear, I, I look up and I see like lights reflected on like the side of the door uh, and like uh, it's like going everywhere. I'm like, what, what, what's going on? Like, did you get a new light from Amazon? Like, what's, what is this? Because the reason why I, I wonder that is, um, I guess I'll, I'll tell this story first and then I'll, I'll get into her spending my money on Amazon. Um, anyway, so uh, I go in and uh, the floor is on fire, part of hers on fire, uh, and also the uh, thing that she had connected to her face with her oxygen machine was on fire because she was smoking with the oxygen machine on. And uh, I, 
I don't know why you would do that. I don't. I, I don't understand it. I, I. I. I don't. Why do you? Why do you? Why? 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 Why do you do that? And there's part of me that's very angry at her. I'm very upset. I it didn't have to be like this. It, there's no reason for it to have been like this. And anyway, uh, so I put out the fire, and it was like a Looney Tunes, uh, a, a, like a Looney Tunes, like a, a cartoon, where like there's like a bomb, and there's like a fuse, and the fuse is being lit, and it's going to the bomb. Well, the bomb was the oxygen machine, and her her little tank connector was on fire and it was literally going towards it. And so I'm like frantically trying to put this out before it reaches the machine and it blows up. And uh, meanwhile, she's on the floor, like, uh, you know, she's just completely in shock and she has no idea what, what's going on really. And um, I, I think that mostly just in shock. And I, uh, the last words that she said to me before they took her to the hospital was, I'm such an asshole meaning that she is for doing it so i think that she did feel like yeah i fucked up here which is like yeah you did and uh anyway so i put out the fire and i'm able to like give her an aloe plant for her face uh for her burns all over her face obviously uh which uh, surprisingly were not really that bad and uh, we had to call the ambulance, which then again, she was telling me, don't call the ambulance, don't call the ambulance. And it's like, I see her there. She has burn wounds all over her face and she can barely breathe. And she was on the oxygen 24 seven and she wants to go to the hospital anyway. And so I called the ambulance. Again, I don't know if it was the right decision, but out of all these you know, questionable decisions that I'll think about for the rest of my life, I feel like this is the one that I will think the least about. And, um, Anyway, so they take her uh, to the hospital, and I don't get a call until like way later on that day. And uh, I uh, I find out that you know she's in like a ICU for like a burn trauma, and I go to see her in a couple of days because she was on a ventilator at the beginning, and I couldn't really interact with her because she was like sedated. And um, anyway, so I, I do all that, and I finally do see her, and the burns on her face uh, were not really that bad um and I, I the truth is that i held out hope that she would pull through this until until the last day man until the last fucking day i was like oh you know things will turn around things will get better things will get better and i thought you know well she got sick pretty fast and like maybe she'll just get better really fast and i i tried so hard to hold out hope and to believe and I tried so many different things, like I, uh, you know, I would, I would look things up, I would talk to my dad about it for hours every day. Um, I, I, I went to, she raised us, not us, me, uh, us, her and I went to a, a church, uh, it's a Roman Catholic church. I had communion and, and everything whenever I was young, and we went to Mass every Sunday. And I even went to our old church to, you know, pray for her and uh, light a candle for her and everything. And I'm not a uh, religious person in a very strong way. I would say that I'm not not a religious person. I just I don't really know. And um, anyway, I I went there because I thought to myself, well, hey man, if there's a one fucking percent chance that that this could do something, like I'll be there every day. And uh, that's what I did. And uh, I I. I I told everybody and I would go and sit with her and I would read all the comments that you all and my friends uh, would make for her and all the things people wanting her to get better and everything and to try to improve her spirits as much as I could and try to just be as positive and, and happy as, as much as I can be and it was really hard um, it really like I've it's never really been like this before for me and so this was a lot and um, anyway uh, uh, things were very back and forth uh, she would be okay one day and bad the next day okay one day and bad the next day and, 
then they would want her to wear like a, a mask uh, for her breathing. Um, it would like supposed to regulate like uh, oxygen and like CO2. And uh, uh, she, she didn't want to wear the mask and it was like a, a fight with like the doctors and, the, and her and it was another fucking thing. And uh, I, uh, um, I, I got a call from my dad and uh, I had, we had to meet with like all the doctors and everybody because they wanted to actually have like a conversation to get everybody on the same page. And whenever we did that, they pretty much told me and my dad that she had in-stage COPD. Uh, that had nothing really to do with the burns. Like she was in critical condition before that fire even happened. And um, we tried everything that we could. Uh, tried different types of uh, treatments, different types of like machines, uh, everything. And finally it got down to the point where uh, we either had to put her on a ventilator or we had to uh, just make her as comfortable as possible. And they told me that, and I knew that I look at her and like, she had so many other things wrong with her, heart problems, like her, uh, everything. I mean, she's 70 years old and overweight. And uh, it's like, if we put her on the ventilator, we're just waiting for something else bad to happen. You know, that's we're just waiting on, we're waiting on the next thing to happen. And I knew it would happen. And it was kind of already happening with some other secondary problems that she was uh, having. Like, uh, it, it was just, it was not a realistic solution. And they and we all agreed that if she went on that ventilator, she'd probably just never come off of it. And I couldn't really bear to, to, to put her through that. And uh, so we tried to just make her as comfortable as possible. And uh, that's pretty much what happened. And again, I just, I don't know if that was the right decision. I, you know, we had a lot of conversations about our quality of life and everything, and it was all just fucking grim, man. It was just fire and brimstone grim. And I just, uh, it was the hardest decision I've ever had to make. And my dad and I obviously made it together. And uh, I don't know if it was the right decision, but I'm pretty much certain that it was. It was inevitable. And um, uh, my mom, like, she wasn't just like a mom for me. Uh, like Zach and, and Cody and Lowell and Cameron and Jeff and uh, AJ and everybody else in, in my neighborhood and, and in a way, you know, our, our little makeshift family. She would always ask about Cody and Jeff and she would say, how, how are my other sons doing? And um, it was so hard to tell Cody and, and Zach, man, it really was. Oh man, it really was, like, I, I'm not an emotional person, but instead of being filled with, like, grief, it's just filled me with so much emptiness. Uh, she was my best friend, and I spent, I would come home and I would be so happy to see her and uh, I would lock the door whenever I'd leave so nobody could come and like bother her or anything. Uh, she was just so precious to me and so important to me and um, it wasn't just to me, it was to all my friends too. Uh, and. I, I want to say that so many of 
so many people have reached out, so many of you guys have reached out and uh, been so supportive and, and so you've shared, like there's a guy I talked to a couple of days ago and fuck man, the guy's going through the exact same thing that we had to go through. Like he's in that, he's in basically the stage of the meeting with the doctors at this point. And fuck dude, like, and that's the kind of shit, like that's why I'm making this video, man. Because I know that I'm not the first person to have to deal with this. And I, I feel like I should share what's happened to me. And um, some of the people, like everybody in OTK, um, uh, especially Tips, uh, Tips that check on me pretty much every day, uh, has just been so supportive and everything of, of me and everything. I've just been so lucky. Uh, my friends, uh, Zach and, and Cody, and uh, other people too, obviously you all might not really know, uh, have just been there. Like my dad has just been there for me and I've been there for him too. Like you gotta remember like, my mom and my dad knew each other for 50 fucking years. It was, I think it was a lot harder for him than he lets on. And that really does kind of make me sad, but Anyway, um, also, um, whenever I, I told uh, Izzy uh, that my mom was in the hospital, she had a, uh, there's this little, like, Swedish horse, and she had a special hand-carved Swedish horse sent to the house, and she wanted me to give it to my mom whenever she came back home, and uh, whenever she found out that that might not happen, uh, I brought it directly to the hospital, and I gave it to my mom around along with also a Swedish cooking book so she could look at all the different meals and everything. And my mom, the horses were her favorite animal. It made her so happy and uh, Izzy was there for me like every day and we talked about it and her and my mom were very close too. And uh, they spent a lot of time talking and just being together. And uh, not a whole lot I guess but as much as you would expect from, uh, uh, you know, two people that live in the same house. And uh, anyway, whenever they were both living in the same house with me, uh, we pretty much were running a, uh, a miniature Amazon warehouse. There's, I'm not even kidding, like probably five to ten packages coming to the house every single day that between the two of them they would order. And uh, my mom, of course, was using... Social Security does not really pay that well, so she was using my card and I she would buy so much stuff and like we had no room for this stuff but it made her so happy and how could I say no I mean she was so old it was hard for her to do anything this is one of the only things that she could do to make herself happy of course I of course I did it and um, but it was a pain in the ass having to throw away all the boxes every week though and uh, yeah I, I really wanted to say that so many of so many people have been so much uh, so so important to me through this, and to all of you, thank you so much. And um, I, uh, for like, what am I going to do now? Like, what's what's going to happen now? I uh, I don't know when I'll be back to streaming on my main channel. I have no idea. I really don't. I have to, like, obviously we have to do, like, a, a funeral, and I have to see my family, and uh, there's a lot that I have to do, and it, it's not going to be simple, and it will involve traveling and, and everything, and so I can't really say when. However, I would like to come on my alt stream and just kind of give my fucking opinion about things and talk about stuff that I'm reading online that I have to get my two cents for because if I, I it's either I talk to the camera or I sit in front of a mirror and I almost have the conversation with myself so I just have to get that out there and so I do hope to continue making uh, maybe YouTube content I do on my second stream maybe a couple times a week maybe hopefully uh, other than that uh, just you know, keep up with my Twitter and I'll let you guys know what's going to happen. And I want to say to everybody and not just, you know, my close friends and, and family, uh, 
I really appreciate everything that you all have done. And I know how much many of you all like loved my mom and thought that she was great. I got so many good comments about her and people were so nice. And I thank you so much. It's made me feel so humble and so small to realize that I had that many people around me who cared. And I really appreciate every single one of you. Thank you. I, I don't really know if my life will ever be the same. I was such a good boy. And we just would sit here in this house and play video games and hang out and she'd make us like cupcakes and we were just good boys. It was so fucking good, man. It was so fucking good. And I feel like the truth is that this is what happens to everybody. And now I guess it's my turn to give that to somebody else. That's the most that I can really say. And I think that's what she'd want to. She was the most uh, uh, genuine and uh, pure-hearted and kind person that I've ever known. And I think that from now on, I'm going to try to be a little bit less of an asshole. Try. I really am. Just try to be a little bit more relaxed and more okay. So, I'll be honest, I'm glad I'm done with this video. Uh, I wanted to tell you all pretty much what happened and uh, how things went with me and uh, where I'm at. I hope to see you all soon and I'll probably have new videos coming out and I'll be back soon. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you later. Peace.